tell us a little bit about Owen the man, about Owen the husband and the father. Mm-hmm. Did he marry and have children? He did. Uh, yes, yes, he, he, he married a lady called Mary and they had 11. I'm sure many of your listeners will also have huge numbers of children like that. But it's, <laughs> it's uh, more common in those days than it is today. They had quite a sad life, really, because unfortunately, only 10, uh, only one of those children survived beyond infancy. So 10 of mm. them died oh, in wow. infancy. And actually, the 11th child did also to die before Owen and had a, oh. a really difficult marriage and a difficult life and then died. So he saw he had to bury all 11 of his children. His wife also died and he, he remarried uh, after she died. Uh, he married a lady called Dorothy uh, as his second wife. But yes, life wasn't easy for them as a family. Hmm. What do we know about how that impacted him? Did he write about those deaths <clears throat> of his all of his children and his wife or or do we not have a lot of insight into that side of him? He's not terribly autobiographical, we might say. So he doesn't ever seem to base his uh, theological assertions on his own personal experience or try to gain credibility by talking about what's happened to him. You do see some of this, you get an insight into some of the um, the personal life of Owen by reading his letters. There are some letters that survive. He, as a pastor, wrote to a woman in the congregation that he was looking after who had lost a child. She's grieving. Owen is trying to show her the comforts of the gospel. And he doesn't talk about his own experience of losing 10 children. However, Uh. he does say in that letter that if she was to throw herself on Christ and look for comfort to him, that Christ would be to her more than 10 children. And you realise if you know Owen's life at that point, that that is actually an autobiographical comment Hmm. obliquely obliquely made so unless you know him and who he is you wouldn't necessarily get that but he's talking about his own experience of knowing that christ is a greater comfort in times of grief than we could ever imagine Hmm. Hmm. so yeah we do get some of that we get some insights like that Hmm. yeah that's just such an incredible little transparent moment that yeah having a little bit of that context helps you to see how truly autobiographical that actually was there's some other um, times i mean i was, remember reading through the commentary on hebrews and you know i'm looking at the details of the greek exegesis and trying to translate the latin and hebrew as i go and then suddenly as he's speaking about the tears of christ hebrews chapter five he has a wonderful little comment just suddenly where he talks about himself and he says very you know unexpected and out of character and out of place almost in the commentary he says um i don't know how other people cope but i have often much ado to keep from longing after the shades of the grave and that's just an insight into the despondency and difficulty that he had psychologically at that time and he wouldn't have the language that we may have now I I guess to express some of that Uh, he doesn't talk about depression or anything of that sort but that is what is that is what is going on Mm. I, I long for the shades of the grave Uh, and the rest of another world. You know, he just drops that comment in because he understands the tears of Christ are also his tears in some way. Mm. Sometimes I think that can be one of the hardest things about studying history and even reading the words of historical figures is Mm. we can feel such a separation from them. And sometimes when they aren't as forthcoming with those personal details, like we're used to being, we're used to reading books today where there is a lot of authenticity, so to speak, to the writer sharing how they feel about things. Is that uh, the can, American can... word for narcissism? I don't know. Nah. <laughs> you called it authenticity, Maybe. but Maybe. for some people it does come across as very, you know, individualistic. And yeah, um, yeah. it's not Owen's style at all. He, he yeah. wouldn't talk about himself in that sort of way. But I think sometimes the challenge, though, for us as modern readers is it can be we can kind of forget that these men and women were real humans. They were, we were yeah. just like us in so many ways. And, you know, when we read this tragedy that 10 of his or 11 of his children died before he did, we can kind of be tempted to think somehow it wasn't as bad for him as it sounds like hmm. it would be if it were us. Wow. But I think it's, it's so <laughs> helpful to get those little insights in where we catch a glimpse and, and other, obviously other figures are more transparent with some of those things. And we kind of see, no, no, these were people just like us in, in every way. 
there are some great vignettes that you can mention about her. And so when his academic career was cut short by the rise of Archbishop Lord, who is the great big bogeyman amongst the Puritans, he's the bad guy. We all go boo and we hear Archbishop Lord. <laughs> a Lord came in and enforced a sort of anti-Puritanism upon the University of Oxford. That cut Owen's career short. And when that happened, he, his hopes were dashed so much and he was personally so engaged in that and so involved and connected that he hardly spoke to anybody hmm. for, three, for three whole months. But in his writing, he thinks, and in his preaching, he thinks he is standing in a pulpit, he is addressing you with a word from God, so he's not there to talk about himself. He's not writing because he's got something to say about himself. He thinks he's teaching, preaching to you. And so he's mm. more going to be talking about Christ than then talking about you. Uh, mm. And he's trying to stay out the way, in a, in, in a sense, so that the message can come through him to you. Yeah, and that's where, like you said before, maybe that we should view that as a sign of his humility and, and the soberness yes. with which he took his role as a teacher and a preacher. 